Uh, now we are going to move on with our program to the next speaker, uh, James Putnam, independent curator, writer, research fellow at the University of, Fine, of, of the Arts in London, is going to talk about contemporary art interventions. Welcome. My talk is going to be totally different from what you've heard so far because um, I, I'm really an independent curator. I'm, I'm currently attached to London College of Fashion where I do their uh, outside exhibitions, off-site exhibitions for them. And um, I'm going to talk more specifically about the Freud Museum where I've done a series of uh, artist interventions there. And um, in a way, my, my project leads, or my talk leads on quite well from Kimberley's in the sense that um, small sort of uh, what we could call iconic um, museums uh, have, have increasingly um, got into the idea of, um, of introducing contemporary art projects into them. And um, it's often not easy to do something like this, um, particularly in a situation where the house, in the case of Freud's house, which I'll show in a minute, has a lot of furniture and artifacts to do with the um, do with the particular person. It's actually charged with the, with the aura of that personality, which is very different from um, often what I usually do is put you know, contemporary art in, in white space galleries and sort of white cube situation. Often there's not funding to set it up. Um, there's often sort of conservative reaction from people that want to visit the house, purely uh, in Freud's case as, as a sort of um, you know homage to, to him. Um, and, um, as I say, this is you know pretty much an increasing trend, and, and like what we were talking about, uh, Kimberley's uh, project. I remember going about 20 years ago to um, to a big uh, conference in New Zealand, uh, where they were talking about artists' interventions in museums and innovative projects that um, curators have done. And um, that time, I was working at British Museum. I have a very um, kind of eclectic background. Really, I, I was a curator at the British Museum for about 20 years in the Egyptian section, and um, in a way, that's what brought me first to Freud's house. But at this conference I went to, um, I remember Peter Noever actually gave a paper there about uh, the Schindler House, and um, he was kind of um, doing, you know, very outspoken and some projects. He got contemporary artists to. Um, he had seven contemporary artists at the Mac in Vienna doing a, um, sort of permanent uh, installations, uh, you know, rehanging their Art Nouveau collection there, um, which was pretty amazing back in 1995. So I was doing projects with contemporary artists in the British Museum um, in um, around 1994, 1995, and then founded a program there. But um, yeah, I'm showing this first slide, of course, of John Cern's house who, as we know, is a you know, very famous architect built the Bank of England, um, really uh, obsessive collector, went on the, um, uh, the grand tour and, and bought all these busts and things, and yet the, the Stone Museum has been a, a site for many contemporary art interventions. Um, probably most recently, but I think he also did something now, I gather, I didn't go to it, but um, you know, it's a place that's absolutely, it's very much, um, a sort of artist come architect installation by Sohn himself, where all the objects were um, carefully placed by him. But it gives you an idea of um, you know, the obstacles that one's up against. So here we have the Freud Museum. And in fact, as you probably know, there's two Freud Museums. There's one in Vienna, um, in Bergstrasse, where Freud has spent most of his life. This, this is a place that um, Freud came to in 1938. Um, he was, of course, born in 1856, but he, he came to live here in 1938. Um, like a lot of um, uh, Austrian emigres, Jewish emigres, who came to this place in North London, which is close to Swiss Cottage, Finchley Road. And um, this, this house was found, he, he moved to a smaller house to start with, and then this was prepared for him. Um, the interesting thing about the two museums is that one is, the one in Vienna is, of course, where he did all his work. And, um, but it's basically like a sort of shell without any contents. Uh, Freud was lucky enough to get out of um, Vienna with all his possessions. 
And so uh, he actually had a young photographer that photographed all of his, uh, all of his collection in situ in Vienna. And he, re he had it all reinstalled in this house uh, as it was in his, uh, in his apartment in Vienna. And he very much um, tried to, to make it sort of comfortable and actually was still practicing psychoanalysis here. So um, he actually died in 1939, just after the start of the Second World War. And um, his daughter, Anna Freud, uh, continued her psychoanalytic practice uh, until, you know, about the 1980s when she died. And then it became a museum. And um, it doesn't have really a lot of funding um, to keep going. It's not, I don't think it's even recognized as a, as a, as a museum as, as such uh, by, by authorities, but it has a group of trustees. And most of its visitors are, um, you know, people making a lot of American psychoanalysis coming there to, um, you know, make a sort of pilgrimage to Freud's house. Um, there you go. Um, it's not a um, outstanding house in terms of its architecture compared to the modernist houses we've been looking at. So, I mean, the interesting thing about it, or, or the interesting thing about doing the program there, is um, perhaps to um, you know celebrate a lot of um, theories and the influence Freud had on a lot of um, artists at the time. Um, he was obviously um, big influence on the surrealists. And, others, but he's also quite a big influence on a lot of contemporary artists, and so the idea of doing projects there is very much to, um, to, to sort of, you know, uh, carry on this sort of, keep, keep the house alive with, reanimate the house in a way. Um, and there's Freud um, sitting at his desk. Um, he was about 80 when he died. He came there already having suffering from mouth cancer, um, which, you know, he finally died of. Um, and he, as I said, my, my first inroad into the museum was when I was working at the British Museum. I was the curator of Egyptian antiquities, and Freud had an amazing collection of antiquities, not only Egyptian, but uh, classical, Greek and Roman, some Oriental. And um, here, here he had all these sort of little statuettes assembled on his desk. Um, but he, you know, he, 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 was, he was a really obsessive collector, in fact, uh, in Vienna. Uh, he bought regularly from a number of uh, uh, dealers there, and um, one of the connections with the British Museum when I went there was to, um, you know, look at his collection and, and um, research it and decide, you know, there, there was obviously some unauthentic works and some majority of authentic works, but it was generally a very good collection. So there he is again. Um, actually, no, that is, that is in Bergstrasse, so that's not at uh, Mersfield Gardens. Um, there we have his collection again, which in a way is quite, um, it's quite Jungian, it's quite unfreudian. It's almost based on these sort of archetypal um, figures that uh, various gods and goddesses. And there's a little plan of the house. Um, it's, not a, it's not a big house, you know, by, by the standards of what we've been looking at. And because it's of a, of a sort of domestic dimension, it makes it very different from um, you know, what I'm used to is installing work in contemporary art galleries, you know, where the space is white. Here it's, um, you know, here it's a very cluttered house with, with, with um, furniture. I can say that Freud was not necessarily, you know, interested in, you know, modern architecture or modernist at all. Um, perhaps his daughter was more. So the, the place is sort of cluttered with kind of Biedermeyer furniture and very decorative oriental rugs, uh, you know, together with his collection. So this is the kind of ground floor entrance. And there's the sort of iconic um, psychoanalytical couch. Um, you can see with all the, um, all the antiquities around. And in fact, um, it, it's very, um, I think one of, the, one of the things one encounters as a curator trying to install contemporary work into this museum is that it's very hard to, um, to, to pick it out. It has to be interwoven with it collection itself, and yet not to be um, that obtrusive, and not to be, um, you know, stand out like a sort of piece of very avant-garde sculpture there, you know, you, you have to sort of blend things in. Find the work that conceptually works with Freud's theories, I think that's one of the criteria to work with, you know, what, 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 
when we put as can we do here, that um, will be something in tune with Freud's writing, um, but also be not a, um, you know, a, an eyesore into the collection. And, um, and as I said, you know, this comes to the, the whole thing about, you know, with contemporary art, does it all, always have to be viewed against a white background? And um, so doing projects here, it somewhat contests the, um, the Museum of Modern Art um, aesthetic of, of the white space of the, you know, in order to appreciate everything properly, you have to look at it against the white background. Um, I don't actually hold with that theory because I think as human beings we can, we can frame things with our own eyes and we can, we can see things and it's something of a bit of a phony aesthetic. Many people say it's sort of, it's linked to the idea of the, um, you know, puritanical idea that, you know, things have to be pure and white and that, um, you know, you can only really appreciate things purely there. You know, to give it an almost sort of temple-like quality if you walk into, you know, MoMA or Museum of Modern Art or Tate or something like that, you know, everything is, is very anaesthetized. In this situation, we're walking into a house that is um, highly charged, you know, with the aura of its past participant. Having said that, I have to say that, um, you know, there is, there is something of a, an expectation of people to come to the house that don't necessarily realise that Freud only lived there for a year and a half or so, and so they, they think that all these great writings were done here. And then, of course, because Anna Freud lived in there after him, where by the time it became a museum, probably the positions of things were moved around quite a lot. Uh, and so, you know, this is not necessarily exactly as it was in Freud's day. You know, there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of rearrangement been going on. And um, I don't think, I mean, I'm certainly not the only person to have done contemporary art projects here. Uh, they've had them going for, for quite a few years. The first one I did was back in 1999. Um, but they continue to do some. Some that I, you know, feel don't work so, so well. You know, they're, they're a bit sort of brazen with the way they, they put contemporary art in there. Um, but this is to give you an idea of what we're dealing with here. And very, very decorative uh, surroundings. Lots and lots of you know little statuettes and velvet curtains, and it's generally quite a dark place. Um, there's Freud's dining room. Uh, he also liked these. Um, I think it's a sort of naive peasant-type furniture, with painted furniture, which is another um, uh, characteristic. He certainly really loved loved furniture a lot. Um, there we have the couch again. So this just gives you an idea of. Um, what the house is like, and um, I would say that um, you know a lot of people aren't so aware of its existence unless you're interested in Freud particularly. Um, the challenge with doing contemporary art projects there, or indeed the um, the incentive or motivation for doing them there, as far as, far as the museum is concerned, is to um, get a bigger audience into the museum. Um, I think some of the shows that we've done, that I've done there, um, you know, they've doubled the audience figures and it's a, it's a paying museum. So people pay to come into the museum and, you know, if, if you're up there visitor um, numbers and you get, um, you know, good publicity. I found it's actually quite a good place to, for people to, to write about um, the contemporary art projects there because often the, the critics will, um, you know, tie it in with the theme of Freud in some way, so it's, it has a good sort of hook line in that respect. So there's Anna Freud there, um, and um, she, she was the first to sort of practice some um, um, really child psych psychoanalysis. And in fact, there's a whole Anna Freud centre near to the museum, which still operates as a um, child psychoanalysis centre. Um, so this is the first project I did in '99 with um, Sophie Cal, who you may know is, is a very prominent uh, French artist. Who um, a lot of her work has a lot of text and writing, in. and um, I was lucky enough to coincide this um, first exhibition with the Camden Art Centre, which is nearby where Sophie Cal had a show there uh, before. And um, just to make it clear that all of these projects I'm showing you now are the result of me approaching the museum and saying, how about doing a project with this artist? None of them have actually said to me, do this project with an artist. So um, I've had to pretty much sell them the idea of doing a project. And she's a, a, you know, who I think is a relevant artist to work with. 
uh, but that leaves me with a, uh, you know, a situation where there's no budget to do the exhibition, so I have to raise money either from the Arts Council, uh, from uh, the, the prominent gallery that might um, be representing the artist. So um, with Sophie Cow's project, uh, Sophie has a, a sort of collection of personal objects that she's installed at various other museums, like Boyman's Museum uh, in Rotterdam and several other places. And um, she came to me, well, when, when I asked her about doing a project, she said yes, she wanted to do this project with a personal museum, her personal collection, which I wasn't so excited with at first, because I thought she was going to come up with a totally new project, but in fact it was somewhat new in the sense that it worked perfectly with um, juxtaposed with Freud's collection. And here we have her wearing Freud's coat. Um, Freud, when Freud came by train from Vienna in exile, uh, he was wearing this coat. And um, funnily enough, the, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't even on display. It was in an old cupboard there. And, um, and there, there were lots of What I noticed uh, at the museum, they, you know, they somewhat depersonalized the idea of Freud. He not had many personal things that were actually um, attached to him, which you know, was rather interesting. I think that's since, uh, you know, coming to notice with this, um, with this coat. So, one of Sophie's insistence on doing the show was to put her wedding dress on Freud's couch, which at the time, the director of the museum, you know, was you know, really objective about it and said, you know, we can't do this. Uh, people come here just to see that couch. You can't put a wedding dress on it. And so Sophie said, well, um, if we don't put my dress on it, I'm not doing a project. Uh, I was sort of stuck in the middle of, you know, trying to negotiate the thing. And in the end, um, yes, uh, the director said, let's go ahead and put it in. Um, we, did, we did have a visitor's book there where people made comments about the exhibition, and most of them were very favourable. They kind of got the idea of why we were doing this show there. People looked at it like it was almost like the ghost of one of Freud's patients on his uh, psychoanalytical couch. Um, this was actually a wedding dress that, um, uh, when Sophie was, was about 18, she had an affair with um, an older guy who promised he'd marry her, but never did. So she walked around and bought this wedding dress, and all of her um, personal museum has these very kind of poignant texts alongside. Um, although they were written originally in French, they're translated and they work very beautifully. And so alongside all of her objects, she had um, a relevant text. Most of her texts were to do with, um, um, you know, either you know, sort of things when she was growing up, sort of, you know, affairs which she had with men, uh, you know, sexual things, uh, childhood memories, and um, this particular one was um, when she was a little girl and she went to a restaurant with her father, and um, and the waiter had put down this banana dessert on on the table. And said, uh, and winked at her and said, enjoy. And of course, it's very phallic with a banana and two ice cream skis. Um, so we have, I, we put it in Freud's dining room, and Freud's sitting down on it, just put it in there, but um, it seems to be quite relevant. Um, so, um, let's just go back there. Yeah. There were, so we, we put these texts uh, alongside uh, Sophie's collection uh, on little pink cards. And it was quite interesting that. Um, Afterwards, the, um, the museum itself were quite influenced by what we did because they put similar little texts with, um, with Freud's interpretation of dreams uh, against various objects in the museum, um, which was also you know, quite interesting that um, you know, they, they actually got something from the exhibition themselves. Um, so the next project I did was with um, the artist Sarah Lucas. Um, now, Freud was, was kind of obsessed with smoking cigars, that's probably why I ended up with mouth cancer, but um, <coughs> similarly, Sarah was obsessed with smoking, and um, this, was, this was part of a little invitation we did to the Freud Museum um, show that Sarah Lucas had at the time. And I was surprised that she, she had actually read quite a lot of Freud, and she was particularly motivated by uh, Freud's text or short essay called Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And her whole project is pretty much about that. Um, she's an artist or sculptor that works a lot with chairs. And um, she was very inspired by Freud's anthropomorphic chair, which was actually designed uh, by his son, Freud. And um, it's anthropomorphic in the sense it has a sort of you know, human 
human type figure uh, in it. And um, so she, she installed a number of her chair pieces uh, in Freud's study in this um, uh, big um, image of the t-shirt um, on the top of it. She also um, did, she, she had two, two, two titled works called Beyond the Pleasure Principle and Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And it was quite interesting that, um, that she developed a whole new series of work as a result of, um, of this. And there was afterwards, um, the, um, the Tate Gallery bought uh, one of her major works and had a whole series of rooms at, at, uh, at the Tate Modern uh, Sarah Lucas rooms. Although, you know, there again, it was one of these things where, in a way, this was a, this was a work that, that worked perfectly in contrast, and one wonders how it loses uh, a lot in, in, in context when it's moved to a uh, you know, contemporary art museum here. It, was a, it seemed very charged, you know, within, her, within the room. So another artist I worked with was an uh, uh, American artist called Anne Gallagher. And, um, in all these things, it's always a question of, um, you know, how, how relevant can you make the project to the, the life and work of Freud? And in her case, uh, before she, um, she became a contemporary artist, she wanted to be a marine biologist. And, um, uh, and you know, we found that Freud, in, in, in his early years, in his formative years, before he, you know, developed his theories about uh, psychoanalysis, he, he also was interested in marine biology. And um, you can see these, these sort of drawings of sea creatures, and there's one in a, in, in a, in a, in a jar there. This is, a, this is an actual drawing by Freud himself that he made um, when um, he, was, uh, you know, he was studying um, marine biology or, or interested in it. Uh, and there's one of uh, Anne Gallagher's um, pieces in, in this sort of bell jar, which is made out of cut paper and was put into Freud's room. <coughs> so I did another project with um, uh, two artists, Tim Noble and Sue Webster, um, who um, were obviously very interested in the sort of sexual aspect of Freud. Um, they made this work called Black Narcissus, which is a, they're very famous for doing shadow sculptures. Um, and this was, um, this was a work that um, she used a silhouette of both their faces. And if you can see it more clearly there, this was the, as it was installed in, um, in Freud's study. Uh, it, it's actually, a, uh, there are actually moulds of, of uh, Tim Noble's penis <coughs> um, and Sue Webster's finger. And when they're all this kind of amalgamation of them, create this, this amazing shadow. And then, funny enough, next to it, there's a bust of Freud. And then the, the light from this kind of totally, you know, accidentally created a kind of phallic symbol on the ceiling of Freud's um, study, which was um, quite an um, amazing thing. Um, so when I went to see them, and often with these things, there's a big kind of dialogue with the artists about, I find as, you know, as a curator, my role is, um, yeah, very much to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to discuss and talk with them about them for the works that they're going to put into the exhibition. And um, also to um, create a sort of, um, I'm trying to be a bit of a catalyst with them, uh, and, and also link them with the specialist curator, like a Freud Museum, for instance. They're all um, really experts on, on, on the writings of Freud, which, you know, obviously I, I have an interest in it, but I'm not a specialist. So I act as a sort of, you know, bridge between the artists and the museum curators when developing this project. So when I went to Noble and Webster Studio in Shoreditch, um, they showed me the Black Narcissus piece, the shadow work that I just showed me. But I also saw this, this rather weird, um, uh, this, you know, in their studio, this table that had all these strange inventions on it. And, um, and I said to them, well, well what's that? And they said, well, that's not really art, that's just something we do for fun. Uh, and in fact, it's, um, it's, it's a very strange, it's got all these kind of rather sadomasochistic, um, you know, things with sexual references. And it's actually activated by sensors as you walk around it uh, in a rather like, tombic or, or sort of Monty Python-esque sort of way. These, these things, these little inventions, these little machines all start working. 
And, um, and the more I looked at it, I said, well, you know, can we put this, can we put this in the foyer? What do you think about it? And they got kind of suddenly interested and developed it a bit more. And, um, and we installed it in Freud's room. Uh, sorry, Anna Freud's room there. And it seemed kind of relevant in a sense, because as I said, she was a, a specialist or a, you know, innovator in child psychoanalysis. And, um, and as soon as we, um, you know, we brought the curator of the Freud Museum uh, to their studio, and the first thing he said was polymorphous perverse. Polymorphous perverse is this idea that as a child you have, all, you have certain sort of sexual things that um, are locked in your imagination, and when, when you get grown up, um, you know, they, 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 they're, sort of, they're forbidden things, but somehow they're still in your, you know, your, your, your unconscious mind. And, um, and, and so, um, unfortunately, you can't really get an idea of this because it's not, move, it's not a moving work, it's not animated. But when you stand in front of it, all these little inventions start going, and you have you know, all these Freudian things like anal retention on the floor, and you know, all these strange sort of cellular messages kind of thing. So, um, this was actually a, you know, a very, um, a, it seemed to really work in the room. And there's, a, there's an invite we they actually um, ended up publish, publishing a book with images all about this work, uh, with little uh, close-up pictures of all of the various parts of it. And it's kind of, you know, funny and ironical, but also quite relevant. And um, here, here it was um, actually shown in New York. You know, they're again out of context in the Freud Museum, but still kind of worked, I suppose, as, a, as an artwork in itself. And I think it was. I think eventually it was purchased by some, you know, Greek uh, or Greek contemporary art collector. <coughs> and, um, another project that I did there was with the uh, artist uh, Oliver Clegg. And he can see an inverted light bulb in Freud's study above the chair. Quite clever in the sense that it, it, it's just suspended there. You can't actually see how it's done. But he worked with some film pop to have like a, um, a, a long armature coming out from the curtain that you couldn't see from the angle you were looking at it. Um, and it's almost like in the position of, you know, where Freud's brain would have been or whatever. And so Oliver Clegg did a whole series of installations. Um, this is obviously a kid's desk, child's desk, you know, with ego, super ego, um, all very, um, you know, major, you know, concepts within the writings of Freud. And also, um, Freud uh, liked to play this game of tarot, um, and he often had evenings where he played tarot. And uh, Oliver Clegg did this um, house of cards uh, in Freud's study, and um, we actually used um, you know, quite a big size um, uh, reproduction of one of the cards with, um, as an invite to the exhibition. And also, he made a series of paintings. Um, they're again a rather um, uh, he does them on, on actually on on old drawing boards, but they show kind of um, children's uh, toys in kind of in a rather disturbing sort of accident-like way. And these were hung in, in the hall of Freud's museum. He also did a series of um, embroideries. Uh, in Anna Freud's room. Uh, it would seem relevant because Anna Freud um, liked um, handicraft and liked um, um, weaving and that kind of thing. Um, so his idea was to do um, these textiles of a series of um, um, uh, medicinal plants, plants that would be uh, used to treat uh, you know, mental ailments. So. Um, that was what he did out of Freud's room. But probably um, his most ambitious work was to, um, to, to, do, to make an exact reproduction of Freud's desk. Um, and on the surface of the desk, he would have like a chessboard. And he'd use um, the major antiquities from Freud's collection as chess pieces. 
this was actually uh, part of a much bigger uh, project uh, by, by an organization called RSNA, who um, did a whole series of chess sets uh, with major contemporary artists, um, people like, uh, you know, Damien Hirst, Eliot Summer, uh, Louise Bourgeois, a lot of famous artists all, were all given the, the chance to, to make chess sets. Um, so that was the way we were able to, to fund this particular project. Uh, and it was, yeah, quite a magnificent uh, um, work for really. me. Um, so another project that I did was with the artist Matt Collishaw. Matt Collishaw uh, uses a lot of, um, um, could we say, kind of distorted images that are um, often based on uh, 19th century um, illusionist devices. Um, anamorphosis. Um, he was very interested in Freud's uh, uh, interest, interest in, um, um, in hysteria. Uh, when Freud was in his uh, formative years, he was a, um, a great follower of uh, uh, Jean Charcot. And above uh, Freud's couch hangs uh, a famous picture, which you can see up there in, in the cylinder, of Charcot. Um, delivering a lecture in front of a hysterical woman, and we have a close-up of it. This is a, um, a, a device um, College Shaw uses where he um, projects an image um, onto the cylinder, which then distorts into the circle, uh, on the, on the, in this case on the serving table. And um, when he did his research all about, um, about Charcot, he found that um, Shaka had created, had, um, had got a book with a whole series of photographs of hysterical women. Some of them actually quite posed, but um, they were they, they were sort of intended to, to illustrate um, you know conditions of hysteria uh, within these hysterical women. And what Collie Shaw did was um, take a lot of these images, and um, this this was in fact uh, he had a slide projector projecting onto a backboard of the tree that had uh, photosensitive paint on it. So as one um, image would fade out as a slight change, there'd be a sort of ghost image underneath it, which was then reflected on the wall opposite. And, um, another work he did was on a, was on a mirror, um, double-sided mirror inside a gilt frame, where with um, an LCD screen, um, with a, a video of this sort of candle smoke changing into a, a sort of ghostly face of one of Charcot's historical, sorry, hysterical women. And um, probably um, uh, one of his most ambitious works was his Soic um, He um, researched a, a device where um, he created this animated effect of um, little kind of um, gnome-like figures throwing stones at, um, at birds and butterflies uh, and so um, this was although it looked sort of static but when, when there was a strobe light behind it it was totally animated um, and then came alive like that so um, yeah so I just want to finish now. <laughs> I think the way you, you explain how you linked artists and their interests together with Freud's interests, that was really, really visual, very, very uh, inspiring indeed.